Hello and welcome everyone. Now, tonight our program topic has shifted due to the passing of a member of John Cowgill's family. But fear not, John will be rescheduled for an upcoming month to deliver his fascinating presentation of small town rail stations. And we hope that you'll join us then. We've had the opportunity to hear John's draft presentation and it's terrific. So please look and join us when it's rescheduled. I'm Ann Mason. I'm a member of the program committee for the National Railway Historical Society's Washington DC chapter. Tonight, I'm sitting in for the vacationing Scarlet work. Our chapter's mission is to expand the public appreciation of railroads and their history through preservation and education. We accomplish this mission through a variety of programs, including sponsoring of scholarship to rail camp for a high school student, operating three rail cars, including the two in cars and our beloved 1923 Pullman car, the Dover Harbor, which is the feature of our discussion tonight. We maintain a railroad library at the Bowie Tower, Maryland, and we publish our monthly newsletter, The Timetable, and I hope you all get that and read it. Another way that we fulfill our mission is by offering free public programs, including tonight's event. Our program tonight is how to redo a Pullman bedroom, and it features John Eldridge who along with Jim Lilly organized the renovation of our beloved Dover Harbor over the last 15 months during COVID. John Eldridge is the president of the DC NRHS and authors our monthly from the office car in our monthly newsletter, The Timetable. Just a few words about John's background. John was trained as an electrical engineer at the US Naval Academy in Annapolis. He spent 30 years on active duty serving as a submariner on five nuclear submarines. This included serving as the director of strategic plans and policy representing the United States in a NATO committee. After leaving active duty, John spent another 16 and a half years serving in a civilian capacity related to the military. Now John retired he chased his early love of trains, and readers will recall his Boy Scout adventures in the July issue, 2020 issue, of the timetable. He came to us, to the DC NRHS, where he shares his talents with us. Tonight, John will tell the tale, the inside story of the renovation of the six bedrooms in the Dover Harbor and he plans to celebrate the work of many volunteers that made this renovation successful. There's lots to tell. So now on to the main event, and let's welcome John for a behind the scenes glimpse of how our volunteers redid the six bedrooms in the Dover Harbor. Over to you, John. Well, thank you, Anne. I appreciate the kind introduction. You've given me a lot to live up to. Pullman built uh, railway cars uh, south of Chicago, Illinois, and Dover Harbor originally was built as a car called Maple Shade in 1923. In 1934, Pullman called it back and rebuilt it as Dover Harbor in its current configuration. It did service with different railroads uh, throughout the period up until it went into private ownership uh, sometime around the 60s, and it became available to the chapter in about 1979. And I think it took about six years to get it from its configuration ready to go into Amtrak service. And since that time, we've been offering it to the public as an educational and uh, historical experience and adventure so they can see how travel was done in the big days of railroad. Those four pictures uh, start in the top left. Uh, that's the beginning, the top right, part way through, bottom left is more along the line, and then over at the far right, that's what it looks like when it's finished. We'll get through the, all that in several steps. How I'd like to proceed tonight is uh, generally along these lines. I do have a co-host who insisted on being part of the presentation. 
we'll go through the steps and how we organized it. I've got a couple of uh, special things, uh, a puzzle and uh, the taming of the screws that we'll get to, and then we'll wrap it up. The co-host, as you may have guessed, is Thomas. This is his official family portrait with his coaches, uh, Clarabelle and Annie, and he's agreed to uh, spend his Friday night assisting me with the presentation. He said he's uh, good at doing color commentary as long as it's blue. What does it take to get motivated to participate in such an undertaking as redoing a bedroom on the Pullman? Well, this is what it takes for me. This is a picture of my dining room, and it looks very innocuous and innocent, but behind those walls and in that ceiling, evil lurks. My house, as many of the other houses at that time in the early 90s, was built with polybutylene plumbing piping, which is prone to failure, which leads to leaks, which leads to damage and leads to trouble. So I called in the plumbers and here's what they started to do. They started making holes because to get to the pipes, you have to get access and they said, we're going to need to make a few holes. Uh, if you look uh, in the, about the center of the picture, the two holes side by side, that hole on the left has about 18 polybutylene pipes because in those days they ran a single pipe from a manifold in the garage all the way up to each individual outlet. So in that picture, you can see five holes. Now I said, hey, is there anything you can do to reduce the number of holes? And so the next picture will show how the plumbers go about doing that. They take two or three holes and cut out everything in between, so you have fewer holes, but they're now bigger. These particular plumbers were not the ones responsible for restoring the wallboard, and I had thought they would save the pieces of the wallboard for me so that we could put them right back in. No, they took every one of the pieces with them, so I was left trying to find a wallboard individual that could do these holes, so I started making templates and I took garbage bags, and you can see some of the templates I made to guide the wallboard repairman as he was going to recover from all these holes. And this is uh, in my living room. You can see the holes, and I said there were a few holes. They ended up with a total of 35 holes in my wall and in my ceiling, and it looks like the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. So I called Jim Lilly, who's our chief mechanical officer, and said, these plumbers are driving me nuts. I've got to get out of here. Is there something I can do on the car? And he says, well, we could take a look at redoing one of the bedrooms. And I said, that's me. Here are the major steps that we went through. Step one is starting out, find one Pullman Company Dover Harbor Series bedroom. Well, there's six of them on our particular car. And this is what it looked like when we started. And that's how it's been in its uh, configuration and maintained over the last several years probably close to about 20 since the last major redo of the bedroom. Now, if you can see some stuff has started to come out, the carpet's gone, the commode seat is gone, the sink is gone, the mattress is gone from the lower berth, and uh, there's more to go, but that's how it starts. I liked after the basic stuff was done, I went up to the ceiling, and this is a vent that's in the overhead, and that's one of the things that I started by pulling out. At the other side of the overhead is a plenum, and that's where the air comes in through that horizontal part that you can see. And the arrow points to a little lever that goes through the plenum and connects to a set of louvers that are behind the plenum. And those louvers enable you to adjust the airflow coming into the bedroom. Uh, we'll see a picture of the, the louvers uh, in a subsequent slide. Notice the fan and the light night light. Those are going to both have to be uh, disposed of as with everything else you see. The only electrical disconnect we had to do was from the back of the fans. And the fans are four speeds, so it has, excuse me, three speeds, so it has four wires. And that was one of the simplest things we had to do. As long as you keep the wires straight, which we did, we were okay. But that was the only electrical part that we did. The night light sits right above the door, and if you can tell that that wire is uh, twisted, and it, well, some of them were twisted quite severely, because there's a little trick Pullman used to get the night lights in and out that I didn't figure out until I'd done about three of the night lights. But that end cap that drops down and that little brown part vertical is what holds the bulb. We figured out how to get those in and out of the night light holder much more easily. 
So here's what it looks like after you get the plenum, the fan, and the night light out. And up where the plenum goes, you see a rectangular square that's got some uh, dirty, a little bit of tingy from some dust up there. That's the louvers that that little bracket maneuvers. And I didn't know that there was anything behind that until I started taking it apart. Notice that the door's gone. And that was a big thing to get out of the way. I learned that the first thing you should take out after the carpet and stuff is to get the door out of the way because it takes up space, makes things more complicated. This is the upper berth of one of the bedrooms and it's completely stripped. All the components are gone from the, the wall. The only little spot you see there, that is the uh, call button for the porter and that's wired in so we didn't connect any wires so that would get masked and stay in place. This is called a hat rack. It is so sturdy you could park a small automobile up there and it wouldn't be phased. If you wanted to do chin-ups in, uh, in your bedroom, you could do it. That's held in by eight screws. Pullman did not hesitate to make sure things were completely secure in the way they had it in the bedrooms. More things are coming out. There's a shelf that would have been above the mirror and some other things. Notice that the wall above the lower berth is completely stripped. It has a uh, pouch that goes in there too. And just to the right of the window, that between the window and the mirror, those items have been taken out too. So we're getting closer to having it all out. Here, getting ready for the painters, that arrow shows that's the sink and the sink is gone. You notice that the lower berth is completely gone and so is the bottom part of the couch is gone. And uh, there are mirrors that uh, are gone. There's a shelf that's above the mirror. That's where the hat rack was. So that's been taken out. The next shelf that came out is just above the upper berth. It's above the window. That shelf is gone. And there's another shelf that's just between the sink and the mirror. That's been taken out. One other thing to point out is the electric heater down at the bottom. That wasn't taken out and that was not part of the original Pullman configuration. That was added in so that we could have electric heat because previously the heat had been steam. And so uh, that's not available anymore. Just uh, parallel to the electric heater is the vent plenum. It's down there ready to be painted also. The painter came in and the first thing he did is he would start grinding away at any loose paint, any part that was discolored, any discontinuity in the layers of paint that had been on before, any corrosion that he could find, and he scraped it all away. One thing, these six uh, bedrooms are in uh, one part of the car and the lounge is about half of the car that's in the other end. Each time he did the bedrooms, and he did the bedrooms in three groups, two bedrooms each time, each time he completely draped the lounge to protect all the upholstered furniture and the carpet and everything in there to make sure that we didn't get any extra dust or paint grindings or anything in places that it shouldn't be. So here it's getting close to being ready to be painted. This is a uh, still waiting to be painted. Uh, notice how he's completely masked the mirror in blue and he did a fine job of doing that. And I think the leader of the painting team was the son of Bernie Gallagher, who was our original chief mechanical officer that helped us start with the car. Very knowledgeable in railroading and no longer with us, but he was a good man and his son did a great job of leading the paint team. First bedroom that painted was bedroom D. That's where we started. And, uh, and when we started, Jim said, how about doing one bedroom? And they said, hey, this is going okay. So he said, how about if we do another one? And eventually we got it all up and we did all six of them. But the steps, uh, the bedrooms together, D and C were the first ones. Then we did F and E. And then we did a B and A together. Here we're starting to put things back. And uh, tape has been removed from several locations. And then the upper berth, that uh, top square is a sign that says, please use the ladder when getting into the upper berth. The round thing below it where the arrow's pointing is the call button. The next part down is the pouch where you can store your cell phone, which I'm sure they did back in the early 30s. But anyway, whatever little personal items you want up there in the berth with you. 
The mirror shelves in the top right, the hat rack is back in, the shelf above the window is back in, and the shelf below the mirror are all back in. So we're getting some uh, progress done. And below the window, you'll see a couple of pieces of rectangular hardware. Those came out and those go back in. To the right of the window, all of the components between the window and the mirror have been put in. And this would be the thermos bottle. Below that is an AC outlet. Below that is a uh, razor blade device for throwing razor blades away. And below that where the arrow is, is the handle for operating the heater lever, which controlled steam coming into the each uh, bedroom and gave you some measure of control. And right below that is a rectangular box, a fairly good sized box, and that is uh, installed as a part of a cover over our sanitation retention system, which was not built with the car. Notice that the upper bunk has been pushed up and is out of the way. And I figured that out after bumping my head about 14 times on it. And I said, you know, I could just shut this thing up and probably avoid it. And it, that helped quite a bit. Took me a while to learn that. Here is the, uh, the wall to the right of the commode is called the mirror wall because that's where the large oval mirrors go. And you can see how, what a nice job he did with the painting. And the only component that's been reinstalled on the mirror wall in this particular picture is up by, beside the mirror is the cup holder right there. That light fixture there, uh, you notice it only has one bulb in it up to the right. When we take the bulbs out, we replace them with bulbs that have paint on them because we want to save the unpainted bulbs for as long as we can. And we put those back in when the job was all finished. But we kept moving the paint stained bulbs around depending on which bedroom was going to be painted next. And that fixture that the one bulb is in, that gets detached from the wall so the painter can paint the complete wall behind it. But in order to keep from dangling the fixture by its electrical wires, we would put in longer screws so that the fixture could be moved out from the wall for the convenience of the painter without having to detach any of the electrical components. So that helped and we don't know how old the wiring is, but we don't want a chance having to chase down some wire that doesn't work. How do you keep all this organized? Well, the first step in getting organized is to lay out your tools. There you go. Now, I don't know how Thomas got in there because if the, you had to put an order of most useful to least useful, uh, well, Thomas would probably make the list, but it would be low down. I found out after starting the first bedroom and I did not have an electric screwdriver that I said, whoa, an electric screwdriver would really be useful. So I brought it and uh, it got used extensively. However, whenever we install the screws, we may start them with the electric screwdriver, but every single one was finished, tightened by hand. So we didn't unnecessarily strip out anything. You may look and see the flashlight. I never used the flashlight, but several of the other volunteers had a tendency to drop things and they would need the flashlight to help find them. And I don't know how I avoided this particular affliction, but that verification of gravity will take all things down and put them on the floor somewhere, which is very difficult to find, is just unbelievable. One of those laws of physics that we have to live with. Flashlight and a screwdriver were good uh, instruments to have. Now, for those of you that uh, are looking for what to buy John for Christmas, I eat Cheerios, and those are my favorite Girl Scout cookies right there. But they're made out of uh, cardboard, so I needed the cardboard. So I bought the Girl Scout cookies and the Cheerios and threw the Cheerios and the cookies away, but kept the cardboard. Because what we wanted to do is make little punch boards. And you keep the, the scissors and that little device that's a little pen. I put a piece of tape around it to help me locate it. And then the part with the two blue stripes around it, that's tape over cardboard as a backing plate. So you take the cardboard, spread it out, get it all ready. And the next thing you do is punch. So the little piece of uh, cardboard is behind the board to keep you from punching into upholstery or into a table or into the palm of your hand but you start punching holes in this piece of cardboard. And the holes are kind of difficult to see in this one, but this is for the upper berth in bedroom A, which you will see in the next slide. This is what it ends up looking like. All those screws that came out would go in the appropriate place in this piece of cardboard. 
and for the sign that's the rectangle in the top right, uh, right below the word upper, there are four screws for that sign. The next two holes are for the call button. The next four holes are for the pouch. The two on each side of the call button, the two vertical holes are for the hangers for the net bag, and the three holes over at the left are for the light. Two reasons we wanted to do this. We wanted the same fastener to go back into the same hole. And number two, we weren't sure what volunteers were going to be available when it came time to put all this back together. And if you just had a uh, jar full of screws, oh, this is bedroom A, figure it out yourself, it would have been unmanageable. So this ended up being a good effort in organization. Notice also on this light fixture, it's hanging down from its position using a, a piece of wire, uh, like a coat hanger piece of wire, to also protect its electrical connections from getting stressed unnecessarily. But we made punch cards for every screw that we took out and we grouped them together. So here's the layout for the items for upper A. You can see the punch card and then it's in about the order that it is on the bunk. The net bag is at the top, but then there's the sign, then there's the pouch, and you can see the two hooks, one for each side beside the pouch. And we took all these and labeled them in a Ziploc bag. And this happens to be B, but all of the components for upper B are in that Ziploc bag with the exception of that punch cart. We used a lot of Ziploc bags and we reused them too. Just change the label on them so that we knew where they were going to go. This is what that initial vent up in the ceiling looked like. It's round and it can be adjusted to control how much air comes in. And there is a punch card for it. Eight go around the circular part of the vent and three for the hook that goes on the top. That's where it goes when it's installed and uh, when it came out. You take that uh, vent apart and it comes apart and there are nine pieces to it. And that's uh, out in our baggage car. Now you use the wire wheel and you get some competent assistance to help. Well, we had to look a little farther than Thomas, but the uh, electric wire wheel came in handy and it got well used. We went through about two other wheels wearing them out with what we had to do. This you can get some idea of a before and after picture. Most of these components are some type of brass, if not brass itself, but the corrosion, wear, dust, dirt, and grime you can see on the top one got completely eliminated through some careful use of the wire wheel, cleaning it up to make it sparkle and look like it did in the Pullman days. Up there, uh, just a shot of the plenum again to see some of the components of the plenum. It, it's held in by two pins. Uh, there are a couple more out of the picture to the right for a total of four. And that uh, round uh, device right above the fan is a little handle for going on. But to show how those cleaned up, this is a punch card for those pins. And that's the bracket over to the left. And the two blue pieces at the bottom are the two uh, handles that you'll see in the next picture. And this is what it looks like as they go through the shining up process. And it's amazing how good the brass has held up over all these years and how it takes just a little bit of work and they uh, clean right up. This one, the uh, hanger on the left has been cleaned and the one on the right has not. This is for uh, one of the upper bursts. Here, this is the mirror wall, which has uh, three hangers and then and a whole bunch of screws. So this is getting ready to go under the wheel. Look at the difference in the screws. And uh, the one the hanger in the middle has been done and the two are yet to be done, but it just cleans it up and gives it a nice sparkle. We like that and it was, uh, that was a fun part because you got to see immediate results and progress as we went along. There it is. We're all done and ready to get reinstalled once the painter is finished. This is the control arm, the bracket, and a uh, pin goes through that arm and it would go down close to the floor of the car and control a steam valve for letting heat in and out of the room and you could control it. This just shows it halfway through the wire wheel process. This is what it looks like when it's all the way done. This is in stateroom C, so if you're going to go on Dover Harbor overnight, tell them you want stateroom C, just so you can see what a good job it was on that heater bracket holder.
Some of the components, though, had been painted, and uh, particularly the shoe locker, which is down below the lower berth, and it's a place with a door inside the bedroom and a door outside the bedroom to the hallway where the Pullman porter could come along and check for shoes that needed to be shined. For some reason, it had several layers of paint, and the hinges are very uh, intricate and small and couldn't be handled directly on the wheel. We resorted to chemical weapons. In this case, it was paint remover. And so we dipped them in paint remover and hung them in the baggage car, and it took the, most of the paint off, and then we could go at it with the wheel. All the way to the right hanging down is one of those little brackets that goes up in the vent diffuser that connects to the louvers, just so you can see what one of those looks like. How do you stay organized? You look for spaces to put the components as they come out of the staterooms, and uh, some of them you can see the blue tape on some, not on the mattress, but on the components themselves to tell where they go. And even though components are probably interchangeable without a problem, we stayed away from that and tried to make sure everything went back where it was. I think uh, A, stateroom A components are on the left, stateroom B components are on the right. This is an upper berth and we would usually put fragile items in the upper berth like light bulbs, lampshades, the globes that go around several of the lamps in the rooms are made out of glass and uh, it would be very difficult to replace but we would put them out of the way. And all that blue tape you see there are labeled as to where they go and where they were to go back. This is a problem. Once you start pulling out doors and things, you have to have a place to put them. And it's okay when you're doing one or two staterooms, but when we've got one stateroom going back together, one stateroom being painted, and the next one being taken apart, you run into situations like this. And right in here, you can see uh, there are two ladders, two doors, the sink is on the floor, commode cover is down there somewhere. Uh, to the left behind the door is the lower bunk and it has about six mattresses stacked up in it. Two mirrors are on the floor, oval mirrors from the mirror wall of one of the staterooms, pillows and steward's jackets, and I'm sure that upper berth is filled completely to the ceiling but this required some uh, organization and coordination so you weren't moving things in and out several different times. We got better at it each time we did a stateroom. We had two bins and we would uh, usually be doing two staterooms at a time. So this one was the bin for A where we would put all the components that were removed properly put on punch cards and then put in Ziploc bags properly labeled and we'd put them in the bin. And we probably had about 25 Ziploc bags in a, a bin once we got all the stuff out of one of the staterooms. Okay, uh, in the whole like five and a half months that it took us to do this, this is probably the only time I was fortunate enough to get our tools looking organized. We tried to start out this way and we tried to keep them this way, but this just shows you a lot of the stuff that uh, was involved and how when we did have a space to organize it and set it out, we made the best use of it so people could find the tool they needed, get right on with doing their work. Some of the participants, okay, here we go. This is Bill White. He was able to come out, I think a Wednesday was his day, and so he would come out on Wednesdays and uh, help out. Went right to town, did a lot of good work, as all the volunteers did. Jim Perry, he came out weekdays and uh, weekends when he could, and he did a lot of work too. Notice that we were all COVIDed up. On the days when a person worked by themselves, either in the Pullman car or in one of the baggage cars, we didn't require masks for that. But whenever we were together, we were uh, taking the proper COVID precautions. Baggage car, that guy in the middle in front of the door is Jim Lilly. He's our chief mechanical officer and he's being assisted by uh, Jim Perry and Wayne Potts sorting some items in the baggage car. Okay, here are the birth boys. Uh, in the back, Wayne Potts and Jim Perry, and down front, Jim Lilly and Paul Flanagan. And the reason they're called the birth boys is because of this. They got the births out of the car. And Pullman, uh, having served in submarines, I got a lot of respect for how they built stuff compact and uh, made things fit. But Pullman did a great job of it too. And things fit, but usually just barely fit. So when you take that lower uh, bunk that's lying there, that green rectangle in the front, that's a lower bunk. 
and you got to get it out of the bunk storage. And we'll discuss that in a few minutes. Then you got to get it out the door. Once you get into the hall, you're okay. As long as you don't lift it up too high and take out one of the overhead lights, then you've got to maneuver it through from the hallway, which looking at the car is on the left side of the car there and get it around that corner and out that door. And sometimes you have to lift it up at a 45 degree angle. Sometimes it has to be nearly vertical, but eventually we got it all the way out of the car. From here, it went in the back of Jim Lilly's truck and it went to the upholsterer. So what you're seeing here uh, looks like just one couch. The, the green part is the bed that makes the back of the couch, and below that is the part of the couch that you sit in. The part of the couch that you sit on, that's a snap. You can get that out very easily, but the bed itself, that's more of a challenge. But those were the birth boys. This uh, one day, uh, Bill White and I took time out to get haircuts, I took a before and an after shot, but I'm not sure which one this is. So whichever one you prefer before or after, anyway, that's the two of us. Here, uh, we can't particularly identify this person. I, I think it's somebody that just happened to stop by, saw some activity was going on, put on his mask, went in, did a little work, and went on, and we should have gotten his name. But now we are not particularly uh, definite on who this individual was, but he did some help. That's great couple of things we found out about doing this job, kind of interesting. This is A, a bedroom A, and it just shows the uh, way that things get a little bit soiled over time, and I don't know if that uh, could have been cleaned off to sparkle it up again, but that's just the difference between what it looked like when it was last painted and what it looked like around the outline of the mirror. One thing interesting about the A mirror is it must weigh three times what any other mirror weighs. For some reason, I don't know if it's the glass or somebody has lead in it or something. It is just a very heavy mirror for some reason. This, along the top of one of the doors, and I'm sorry, I, I can't recall what bedroom it is, the word maple shade has been put in there with a punch. And this, uh, Anne was cleverly able to get this uh, enhanced to show more along the lines of where the word shade was. But Maple Shade was the original car, so we can trace that door probably right back to 1923 when the car was built. This is Maple Shade along the end of one of the lower berths, and it's uh, stamped in there too. This was kind of an interesting find under one of the commode seats. It says Villa Gloria, and it has a C on each end, and Villa Gloria was a Pullman car built in 1931. And uh, I don't know why the B is there. I don't know if that came out of our bedroom B or what, but apparently this seat spent some time on the Villa Gloria. Now, I'd like everybody to be sworn to secrecy. Don't tell anybody associated with the Villa Gloria where this seat is, or they may want it back. However, if they do want it back, we're going to compute a charge for storage for the last uh, almost 90 years that we've had it. Anyway, that was an interesting find, Villa Gloria. Jim said, we need to do a repair on one of the commode seats. And I looked at the seat and uh, it's pretty solid wood. So I said, where am I gonna find some wood that matches this? And sure enough, hidden back in baggage car three was a little bundle of wood that's different than the other wood and it's tough wood for sure. And so I said, hey, this is the wood to use. So I cut off about a, um, a two and a half inch strip off of one of those pieces of wood and it's now installed in uh, one of the seats and going to be riding Dover Harbor for the next several years. Back at home, I was making some progress on my holes. I finally found a man that would do the wallboard and here he is. I got his permission to use the picture and his connection to Dover Harbor is that his aunt rode Dover Harbor on the trip to Boston a couple of years ago and she said, hey, my nephew is down in the area, you can use him, and I called him up and he did the job. You notice that piece of uh, wallboard right above his head is kind of a bluish gray, and I said, hey, can you use that? And he said, yep, that's from Canada. That's the color that they use for the wallboard up there. So he took it from the picture you see on the left and he made it look like the middle, and then the painters made it look like the one on the right. So I finally got out of my hole in your house mode somewhat. So the family room, uh, it's done. 
This is a before and after in the living room. It doesn't show it painted, but it shows after he did the wallboard repair. This is the dining room, uh, which you saw before and when it's all done. So they can do magic when they get into wallboard and painting to make it look good. But I was uh, glad to see what went on with this. It was kind of interesting. Uh, the first quote I got from a painter was higher than the cost of the plumbing and the wallboard combined. That contractor said it would take three men two weeks to do the painting. And I thought, gee, that sounds odd. So then I found a, a neighbor recommended an individual and he said, yeah, I'll do the painting. He was one fifth of the price. And he said, I'd like to do it tomorrow. So that was a Saturday. I was going up to work at Dover Harbor. <clears throat> I left when the painters arrived. And when I came home from Dover Harbor, all the painting was done. So when they tell you it pays to get a second estimate, there's verification on how it went on my house. Okay, enough of that diversion, let's get back to it. The Pullman puzzle, get ready for this. This is a Pullman lower berth, an innocent looking place. It looks comfortable, put a pillow on there and it's ready for use. Everything is fine until you try to get it out. Now, normally that berth will tip up and come back down to make a couch. And so it swivels on the back and somewhere I thought there must be hinges at the back, but I couldn't see them. So I called in a technical expert. And the technical expert, he sat there and he studied it for about 20 minutes and then he said, yep, that's a hinge. And I thought that was a clever little quip. I said another remark like that, Thomas, and I'll drain your boiler. Uh, that worked nicely to get him back on track. So anyway, after looking at the hinge, this is when we finally got it out, and uh, it's kind of a reverse order. How did we get it out? You don't want to hear about that. But that's where the hinge goes, and that's the, and there's one also over way over to the left that's uh, on the other wall, and that's where the hinge would go. This is the spot, and there's six screws that hold that hinge in right inside the circle. There's the hinge when it's installed. Now, it's not like a hinge that you have on a door. It's a different model of hinge, but it's rather innocent looking. It just sits there and doesn't appear to be a source of aggravation. Well, that's totally incorrect. This is what a hinge looks like. And those are the two, one on each end. And it's just like a sideways V, but there's a slot in the top uh, and the V part points towards the wall. So that's a slot that uh, should provide easy access for the lower berth to come in and out. This is a lower berth and it has two pins. And you think, oh, you just slide those pins in through the slot and you're all done. Well, that's not easy, but it's terrible trying to get them out. This is what it looks like when it's in the vertical in the couch position. And that's what we determined you needed to get it into that position to get that top left pin to slide out of that slot, then it looks like you just roll the berth on out and twist it down a little bit and pull the back hinge out. Well, we eventually got so we could get them out and do that okay. But then we went to put them back together and we had four that we tried to put in on one day. It took us five hours to get four of those to go back in. We just hadn't broken the code on how to do it. So you look at it, and this is again the same picture, with about three eighths of an inch clearance on each end of the bed, it's very difficult, even once you get it free of the hinge, to move it around, because you can't just swing one end out because it'll bind. Now in this position, you could lift it up at one end and then get some clearance there, but we found out it worked best if you rolled the back up so it was uh, vertical, and then swung one end out from the wall and then you could bring it out okay. So we learned a lot. We thought we had it down when we put the berth in A. A and B were the last ones to go. We brought A in and it went in in about 25 seconds. And we thought, oh, this will be easy. We brought B in, it took us 45 minutes. So we consider that the Pullman puzzle and we did write up a description of the techniques we used to get it in and out for any uh, future people that try to solve this puzzle. The taming of the screws. To get those two overhead things out, 19 screws and a couple of pins up there for that. The wall over there that has the mirror, and look at that reflection in the mirror. I don't know who that guy is, but that wall over there by the window, 
93 screws to remove all those components. Upper berth, 17 screws. Lower berth, 16 screws. The hall wall has 90 total screws. Now among those, 24 are associated with uh, the door and 20 are associated with a, a shoe locker. So there are a lot of screws on that wall too. 33 screws on the wall with the mirror. And then it starts with the light fixture and then the hangers, the mirror itself, and the writing table all come out. Total, 268 screws. And if you figure 45 minutes for a screw, no, it doesn't take that long. But anyway, a lot of screws. And I'm glad that Jim gave us the idea from the beginning, put them in the punch boards because it would have been a mess trying to keep them out. And this is for each room. What's not listed there are uh, bedrooms C and D and E and F also have a door between them. And that adds another 18 screws to those two. But hey, when you're up to 268, what's another 18 screws? Here's what it looks like when we're finished. That's the new upholstery and the four components that got reupholstered. You can see the two components of the couch, the commode seat got reupholstered, and the sink, which is in the raised position, the back of the sink is also upholstered. The upholsterer did a very nice job and they're all in a nice red and the red uh, fabric has been traced back to a pattern as close as we can get to what was in uh, original Pullman use. But that's what the bedroom looks like and there's an immense amount of satisfaction seeing it looking like that. And this was the moment of truth. It was 9.20 a.m. on June the 12th. CSX brought a locomotive and pulled Dover Harbor out. And success is seeing Dover Park without a coach in it. And we we're glad to see that it finally got moved. And this was after 18 months. And a lot of other work had gone on besides just the uh, bedrooms. The lounges had been done. We'd done the blinds were a very uh, difficult or challenging to get the material and stuff. And the blinds are not an easy installation. And we also did vinyl on the rubber flooring in areas too. So the cars had a good fresh look. Here's what you do, a good technique if you ever want to undertake a project. Here's the Dover Park process. So, uh, inspiration on anything, you go down there and you through, you get down the lower, part way down the left, you get some aggravation, uh, perspiration. I think perspiration shows up there more than once, but it does take it. Over on the top right, right below perspiration, frustration, exasperation, and desperation. Those were the hinge ones. When we got to the hinges, that's what, uh, was driving that problem. We also had the uh, impact of COVID separation, but we handled that very well. But although the volunteers did, you know, the physical work on this, it takes all of us. And even the people that are out there that uh, enjoy railroading, enjoy the history, we do it for you too. And the appreciation that you offer just makes it great. And we, I got down there listed trust, encouragement, and all those others. All of those count, but everybody who has an interest in railroading and uh, lends a hand or lends their appreciation, you're part of Dover Harbor's continued history. We appreciate that and thank you. This is our uh, typical website uh, logo and items, but I wanna point out from the volunteers, in addition to the ones I had pictures of, I've got a few that are camera shy. Carolyn John Zabrowski uh, participated. Chris Holmes came out. He was an Air Force guy, and uh, I don't usually mind working with uh, Air Force people. But he was very good. I don't mind any military people, but it was good. He came out, and the first day I had him taking down vent plenums, and he came back. I was surprised about that. Bob Craycraft came out and lended a hand, and there's uh, Donna Dolan. Now, she didn't get exactly into Dover Harbor's work, but she helps maintain the baggage cars. And if it wasn't for uh, Donna Dolan keeping the baggage cars organized, they would look like my brother's garage. And uh, that is like an interminable hunt for things. But anyway, Donna does a great job. We do have a continuing need for volunteers. And although the maintenance is done, now that we're operating, if anyone's interested, a steward, a porter, or a chef, we will train and we'll get you uh, out and doing something and get an appropriate level of challenge for you that you can help us out with. Librarian is, uh, the library is now open again and we do not have a uh, head of the library committee, 
and that can be anybody that's just any kind of good with administration. The only hard and fast requirement for the librarian, and we can probably weigh that too, is you should be able to read because I'm just not sure that a librarian would have a lot of fun uh, if that was not there. Reservation agent is the person that helps coordinate the public with the availability of the trips and uh, signing them up, getting them paid, getting the initial arrangements so they know where to go and what to do. And uh, I couldn't resist putting that item at the bottom. We will train, but you know how that goes. The timetable is our outreach way to keep people informed of what's been going on. I hope you've been following up with that. And I uh, came into writing the articles uh, right about the time the 75th anniversary was uh, showing up for our chapter. And I had these letters from my aunt who was a nurse 75 years ago during World War II. And for those of you that read the timetable, uh, she's been uh, at Shepherd Field now in Texas and has now moved to Boston. But I thought I'd put a picture of her in here. She is the one on the far right. And next to her is uh, one of her sisters and then her two brothers. And here she is cleaning fish. I don't know if cleaning fish got her interested in being a nurse or what, but anyway, this is a picture. And the next picture will show her with all of her siblings. And the aunt that was the nurse is in the exact middle of this picture. On the far right starts her oldest sister. The next sister is Jane, a second from the right. And her son is my cousin, Mark. And Mark has ridden Dover Harbor to New Orleans three times. The next is uh, an uncle. Then the next uh, person right behind my aunt is her sister, Henrietta. And you'll read about her, I think, in the August timetable. When my aunt was in Boston, Henrietta was going to fly over with her husband from Detroit to visit her. But the plane got canceled, and so they rode the New York Central. And Henrietta and her husband ended up only spending one night in Boston, but it meant so much to my aunt because uh, she was in Boston getting ready to deploy. To the left of my aunt's a sister and a brother, and then is my mother is next to the last. And um, her son, speaking, and her grandson have both ridden on Dover Harbor. So from that family in the uh, straight north of Michigan, uh, Huron County on Lake Huron, uh, we've got some connections to the Dover Harbor, but I thought I'd include that. Here it is, Jim Lilly and I were watching it, and Jim likes to point out that it took two engines to pull Dover Harbor. All right, I haven't uh, watched the chat, but if there's something coming up, Ann, if you could guide me along a little bit or type in questions, I'd be glad to entertain any uh, specifics. And please only ask questions that I know the answer to. Thanks, John. That was that was terrific. Um, we don't have any questions, but there's still time. Question. Given there were so many screws, were there any screws that were hard to remove, like stripped screws? Well, uh, <clears throat> good question. Stripped screws are not hard to remove. Those come right out or they don't work. Pullman did pull a couple of stunts. We did try to remove a screw, and I remember, I think it was Bill White was just going nuts and trying to remove this screw. It turned out it wasn't a screw. It was forged to look like a screw. So when we finally got that one out, you know, we were thinking of drilling it. We did have a couple of cases where uh, screws had been broken off. I don't think we broke any, but they had been broken off before. So we had to drill those out and tap them, and we got screws. We have a, a ton of screws on the baggage car, the right size, and normally we can get the right shape. Some of them have curves, some of them are flat, some are Phillips, some are slotted. We got the right one to go back in. We did have to tap a few holes to get them to go back in. But most of the time, the stuff came out real well. So there was another question that came up about the painters in the Dover Harbor. And the question was, did they spray paint, roll paint, brush paint? How did they put the paint on? I don't know. I don't think, uh, I don't think it was sprayed though. But I, I think it was, uh, Harold, you have to ask Jim Lilly about that, and we'll see uh, see if uh, who's uh, if that individual has an email <clears throat> can email me at president at dcnrh dot org. Uh, I'll get that answer back to you. Okay, thanks. And there's a question about 
the there was a question about the color of the Dover Harbor and why was it painted uh, Brunswick green. Um, I'll I'll just say that there is a an article in the uh, Pullman Corner on that, and I will look it up and send it to Eli. But if it's part we've looked at and and Kevin Tankersley has done a lot of research looking at the color of the Pullman green and the Pullman green originally was there's a whole variety of Pullman greens actually there's a scholarly work done by a university expert who is a preservationist of rail cars and she did a really nice study looking at what is green? What is Pullman green? And it turns out it's a whole lot of varieties. Um, but Kevin tracked down the, with a DuPont the paint chemist, the ma best match for our Dover Harbor. And that's the color that we've been using ever since. Speak it, Val is saying that speaking of Pullman, the Pullman National Historic Site in Chicago is having a grand event on Labor Day. And there's info coming in the August news of the NRHS. We're really looking forward to that, Val. Thanks. Keep us informed. So if there's no more questions, well, we'll thank very much, John, for giving us a, a tour of what goes into making the Dover Harbor look so pretty. I know that people are ready to get on the riding the rails again, and, and we'll hope that as the trips come forward, that will be announced in the August timetable, that people will take advantage and come on out and ride the Dover Harbor once again. And also, if you've missed any of our programs or want to see them again, or want to refer your, your friends and neighbors to John's video, it will be loaded up on the NRHS YouTube channel. And as well as we have a couple of videos of the interior views of the Dover Harbor also on our YouTube channel. So feel free to go visit our YouTube channel and um, take a look at what we've got. And Yes, sir. Uh, we have one more question about why is Dover Harbor named Dover Harbor? Uh, I'm not sure, but Pullman has a series of Dover cars, and there were uh, eight or 11 of them, and some of them are still around, but it was just what they chose to make in that series of car. And as far as I know, they're all essentially identical, or were when they came off the fact back from Pullman in 1934. I can answer some of that if you would like. Go ahead, Wayne. What John has just said is true. You know, why they chose to name a series of cars for Dover, England, no one knows 90 years later. But the Dover series was named for Dover, England, Dover Harbor, Dover Straits, Dover Castle, Dover Cliffs, and I'm running out of Dover names. Dover Fort. Dover Fort. There were nine of them. Pullman had a wonderful habit of naming a series of cars and it helped the porters identify the configuration. Dover Harbor has a lounge, a kitchen, and six bedrooms. Once a series was named, the porters knew exactly what they were dealing with. Every Dover series car had six bedrooms, a kitchen, and a lounge. Yes, I think the barbershop was taken out when the bedrooms were added, but um, that is the reason. So whatever series you uh, come across, a county series, a mountain series, whatever, once you get the car's configuration, that's it for that entire series. When John was showing the pictures with the name Maple Shade stamped into the wood. All right. That was done particularly on the bedroom doors. 
that was done before the name change. Apparently, Pullman had decided to start reconfiguring the cars and did not change the name until after the additions had been made. Thus, the original name of the car was stamped into some of the components like the doors and the berths. There's also a couple of chairs in the, in the lounge, at least one. Well, maybe one, I think it has Dover Harbor on it. I don't think any of them have maple shade stamped into it. Well, Wayne, that's great. I think you've uh, answered the question and we now know where Dover came from. There you go. Well, thanks, Wayne. So in any case, check out, check out the, our YouTube channel for our past um, events as well as the tour, the internal tour of the Dover Harbor. And check out our website because there's some really cool um, material on the website, including a whole gallery of professionally shot photographs of the interior of the Dover Harbor um, after the lounge was done. So I just wanna thank everybody for attending and Please come back and see us in our August meeting, and we'll have another great event at that time. So with that, we'll say thank you and good night.